and he'll be talking about holographic gauge mediation. Okay, now it's working. Uh, first, of course, uh, let me thank the organizers for organizing this great meeting and giving me the opportunity to speak and for giving us long lunch breaks. Um, I'm going to talk about work in progress uh, with uh, Franco, um, Sebastian Franco, Shamit Kashru, uh, Dusan Simic, and uh, Toya Dimaski. Um, it's work that uh, has been progress for a while already. I also gave uh, a talk uh, about this uh, at the Eurostrings. Um, and uh, given the summer, I don't think, I'm not sure how much progress we made. Uh, it's still in progress. The main progress is, is that was a Blackboard talk right now. I'm using it on the screen. So that's progress. Um, let's see if this works. Not really. How do I go to the next page? Ah, there we go. OK, this is uh, the short summary of uh, the talk. Oh. I hope it's not going to. It is doing the whole movie thing. OK. Uh, <laughs> now, how do I stop that? Why is this always happening to me? OK. I think I'm in trouble here. OK, uh, you've seen at least what the outline of the talk is. Let me just get started, actually. Um, so um, what I'll be talking about, uh, you could view as, as, an, uh, as a sort of a soft way to get started uh, with string phenomenology uh, with a motivation that's slightly different than the standard uh, motivations. Uh, but let me start with mentioning at least what, what should be motivations for doing string phenomenology. Um, there are many questions in particle uh, theory that depend on Planck scale uh, physics, at least there are a bunch of them, uh, and string theory is one of the few frameworks to answer UV sen sensitive physics questions. So that's the top down motivation, uh, but there are a couple of bottom up motivations, uh, and one of, one of them uh, I would want to call the correspondence principle where uh, if you forget about for a while the fact that we want to include Planck scale physics in string theory, there are limits of string theory, decoupling limits of string theory uh, that uh, describe field theories. And it's a fair question to ask uh, if that landscape of field theories that we can reach as a limit of string theory uh, can be used to do, make realistic looking theories that can be used as a theory for beyond the standard model. And when I say realistic, I don't mean semi-realistic, I re mean really realistic. And that's possible indeed in, uh, in, uh, if you decouple the, uh, the Planck scale, because then you have the freedom to treat uh, the system uh, yeah, as, as a tunable system, uh, and basically you're making contact with quantum field theory. So that's one motivation that one could uh, view from a bottom-up point of view. There's another motivation uh, which I'll be uh, getting to uh, today, uh, which is essentially that there might be uh, things out there, and we know there are things out there like QCD, where strongly coupled gauge dynamics plays a role, and it could even be that there are other theory, uh, hidden sectors uh, that are going to be uncovered by uh, LHC that uh, re-motivate us to think about strongly coupled gauge dynamics. So let us indeed imagine that uh, LHC finds evidence for the presence of a strongly coupled hidden sector. Uh, and there are many of such models that, that phenomenologists have considered, composite Hick models, models, technicolor, uh, name it, uh, where indeed confining degrees, uh, the confining dynamics in some other sector uh, has, plays a role in what takes place beyond the standard model. Uh, even in combination with supersymmetry, you could have gauge-mediated uh, supersymmetry breaking where there's some other hidden sector which involves strongly coupled dynamics, and maybe even the messengers might be involved in that strong coupling dynamics. Or uh, there are even more hidden models, uh, more recently the hidden valley and the unparticles, which are hidden sectors which may be strongly coupled. So let's be uh, very general at this moment, um, and then you can consider an interaction uh, of this type where um, any operator that you can write down in the hidden sector may have an interaction or not with the standard model particles. So this, the visible sector, which is the, the light green, 
uh, and the hidden sector, which is the blue, have these kind of couplings where, uh, okay, if, if there's nothing else interacting, then you just have the stress energy tensor. But uh, if you want to see it at LHC, obviously you want to have couple, couplings to the standard model fields uh, in ways that, that might generate uh, interesting explanations of, uh, of beyond the standard model problems. Uh, one of which could be uh, uh, supersymmetry, supersymmetry breaking, uh, and this is the main example that I'll be discussing, where this particular type of interaction between the, um, with gauge mediation, um, you assume that the hidden sector has a global symmetry whose global currents may be responsible for mediating supersymmetry breaking to the standard model. So let's take that kind of general class of models and then, um, okay, how did I do this? I guess I'm always touching the wrong button here. How do you go? This is back. That's forward. Okay, good. Okay, so I'll be talking about the gauge mediation uh, as, a, as, a, as, a sep uh, as a special case. Okay, now uh, the hidden sector uh, could have a mass gap, sort of, uh, and um, can have, uh, we will assume it has some UV cutoff. Um, if the mass gap is, much, is very high, the typical mass in the hidden sector, then essentially what you want to do is you want to integrate out the hidden dynamics, uh, and everything uh, that's in the hidden sector will then be imprinted in extra couplings of the standard model, uh, renormalization of, of the standard model Lagrangian, but also, for example, in the case of uh, SUSY breaking, cage mediated SUSY breaking, the soft SUSY parameters are obtained by integrating out the hidden dynamics. Of course, if there are hidden particles whose mass is of the order of TeV, you would have to include them in the dynamics. Uh, and essentially, it could be uh, that if, if particles are composite at, at some scale, at a multi-TeV scale, that, that you might imagine producing some of these, um, these hidden particles. But uh, let's take the general setup where we want to look at this whole uh, hidden sector as something that is such, has such a strong coupling and is in a particular regime uh, where we may contemplate looking at a geometric dual. So this is the way in which we're going to uh, introduce string theory, not so much as a way of making the standard model. I'm going to assume that the standard model is just going to be written down by hand, if you like, but that the hidden dynamics can be represented as, as a way of, of, of um, solving, or at least uh, studying the theory, by a, an ADS-CFT type duality. Uh, where, uh, and this is actually rather natural in this first setting, where if you integrate out uh, the hidden sector, the imprint uh, on the visible sector would be via correlation functions, endpoint functions of these operators, and that's exactly what the ads safety correspondence can do rather well, because you can have the coupling to the operators uh, represented uh, as uh, a boundary condition on a classical solution, and then uh, at least in the ads in the strong. Uh, limit where, where this is uh, weakly coupled. Uh, from the gravity point of view, you can take a semi-classical approximation and represent that generation, generating function via this classical action by solving what the corresponding dual is. There are a couple of interesting points about this is that uh, right now I'm just, uh, again, writing down the visible fields as the boundary conditions at infinity, say, I'm putting them on the UV, not infinity in this case, I'm putting them at some cutoff, which is this cutoff lambda, which I call the UV brain, uh, and the hidden dynamics is the one that's being represented by the bulk string theory. But there's already an interesting mix that's going to happen, namely that if we integrate out these hidden uh, fields, they'll actually renormalize the standard model action. So although those standard model fields were written initially just as by hand as things living on that brain, they'll actually get an extra component that comes from the volume when doing the integral over uh, the, um, the bulk. Now, the important thing is that if, for example, that currents that couple to the, um, global, uh, to the gauge fields of the standard model, these are global currents in the hidden sector, according to the ADS-CFT dictionary, we know that they are also gauge fields in the bulk. And similarly, even if, the, if this, the stress energy tensor is the only thing that couples to the standard model, then the bulk physics still has uh, a component that renormalizes the Einstein action. Uh, and all these renormalizations, these coefficients A, B, and C, that come just from evaluating the supergravity action, uh, 
are proportional, of course, to the volume of this ADS space, uh, and they are indeed proportional to the number of uh, degrees of freedom represented in the hidden sector. But now, if you would um, turn on the dynamics um, and um, add the standard model, just by hand, say, and say add gravity, and get your four-dimensional action, you get the 5D action that's induced by this hidden sector. You have your bare action that you've written by hand. And this total 4D dynamics introduces a mixing between the zero modes, essentially, of this 5D bulk fields and the standard model fields or the visible fields. And therefore, uh, yeah, already without having uh, put it in, uh, we, we find that uh, there's an interplay between this uh, the geometric description of the hidden sector where the standard model fields uh, are extended to five-dimensional fields. So that's, that's a, a general feature. So now let me actually get to the example where we want to sort of study a bit more detail, which was also the motivation. And David Chi will talk more about this in the, in the next uh, talk. So uh, in the beginning of uh, this year, uh, there was a paper by uh, Meet Savak and Shi, who summarized in a very uh, attractive way, at least for me, the, 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 the some set of assumptions, a convenient set of assumptions that characterize a very general class of gauge mediation models, where uh, indeed you have just the global uh, supercurrents in this case uh, that describe the, uh, the global symmetries of some hidden sector, uh, but the hidden sector uh, exhibits dynamical supersymmetry breaking, and therefore these currents would have correlation functions uh, that uh, violate supersymmetry. Uh, and that's the only way in which initially SUSY is broken, and then it gets imprinted on the, uh, the minimal supersymmetric standard model or some extension of it uh, by means of essentially evaluating the correlation functions of these, uh, these currents, and that's how you can extract the soft parameters. Um, for, for example, if you take the, the superfield current and you expand it in various components, spin zero, spin one half, etc., then in the notation of, of this paper, uh, they identified certain general coefficients, uh, and the uh, gauge genome masses uh, are proportional, are generated by a particular two point function of the currents in this particular way, which in involves this, um, uh, this spin flip. Uh, but there's another two point functions, these three, three two point functions, one of which uh, is, for example, uh, responsible partly for the uh, fermion, the scalar masses via a, a diagram like this. Uh, and if you would just do weakly coupled um, gauge mediation, then uh, the contributions of these masses are roughly proportional. But uh, the point of this paper here was that if you take these general coefficients, uh, there may be more general theories out there where the relations that one would get out of weakly coupled ga messengers uh, model models uh, would not be uh, satisfied. So one of the motivations after that work is to indeed investigate whether there are ways of thinking about strongly coupled gauge mediation, where actually the messengers themselves are strongly coupled. Or another way of introducing strong couple, coupling in, um, in these kind of models is to actually consider a case where the number of messengers gets rather big, because then the number of fields that go in these loops, the messenger loops, uh, get an extra contribution which is proportional to the number of me messengers, which essentially makes the, the approximation of just integrating them out uh, uh, less, less controlled, and so you have a, a strongly coupled version of this. And this motivates, uh, indeed, uh, looking for a dual description where uh, perhaps we have actually a, a controlled way of looking at this strongly coupled large N extra theory. Now, what one needs then is, is, is a, a, a dual theory where ideally perhaps you would know what the Lagrangian is, but we're also from the dual perspective, from the gravity perspective, you would understand how supersymmetry is broken and that you can actually, in this dual gravity perspective, you have a way of, of, of uh, investigating the way in which the SUSY gets imprinted on the correlation functions uh, and eventually on the soft uh, mass terms in the standard model. Now, uh, our favorite holographic dual with non-trivial dynamics is the clevenos strassler geometry. Uh, which, uh, as we all know, is uh, this uh, quiver gauge theory with a certain superpotential and a bunch of fields. But it has already a, uh, this, the, the right feature, uh, namely that it has a, 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 a ground state with metastable dynamical supersymmetric breaking that's understood 
from the gravity point of view. It's actually a ground state that's not very well understood from the gauge theory point of view, but that's good for our purpose because what we want to do is we want to look at the hidden sector from, from the dual perspective. And the ground state uh, with uh, metastable supersymmetry breaking is obtained if you take this particular cascading theory where the rank n uh, is not a multiple of m, but it, it has a little bit uh, fewer in the rank. Uh, and what we showed in the paper several years ago is that this is a likely uh, gauge theory interpretation of a system where you simply put a number of NTD3 brains at the tip of the clevenos strassner uh, conifold geometry. Uh, and from the gravity point of view, this is rather manifestly a, a particular metastable state. And each one can show that this uh, NTD3 brain itself can uh, decay to a supersymmetric state by an interesting process. So this is really an example not of explicit supersymmetry breaking, but of dynamical supersymmetry breaking. And uh, the way you would uh, determine the difference between the two is if you would look at this particular geometry, the, Clevenus, the, the conifold geometry, uh, and you include the, the deformation due to the symmetry breaking, the supersymmetry breaking, that deformation should be essentially be a normalizable mode. It should not correspond to turning on uh, supersymmetry breaking couplings at, on the boundary, but it should be because of the dynamics of the theory. And indeed, that normalizable deformation was found uh, in, or yeah, computed in a recent paper by uh, Kashru, De Wolf, and Mulligan. And we'll be making use of that, actually, as a way of uh, taking this theory uh, and using this as our hidden sector. So imagine that this would be the hidden sector that's responsible for supersymmetry breaking. But of course, if we want to uh, use this as our hidden sector, we need the messengers, we need fields that have the quantum numbers of the standard model, uh, at least of the standard model gauge group, uh, and can be charged, can be their currents um, that uh, couple to uh, the, the vector multiplet of the uh, MSSM and are responsible for the, for the uh, mass splittings uh, and the soft masses after including their dynamics. So what we're going to do is we take the clevenos strassler geometry, but we add some flavors to it, which are the messengers. And if k is bigger than 5, then we can embed the standard model gauge group inside of it. So again, our standard model is living over here. This is our hidden sector. Uh, but uh, we have these, these seven brains that uh, indeed can be uh, from also from the uh, yeah, ge geometric engineering perspective, you can underst understand why adding a bunch of these seven brains indeed leads to extra flavor notes, an extra flavor note to this diagram. Uh, but the where you put the note actually depends on the type of embedding that you choose for these, these seven brains. They extend in the radial direction of the uh, conifold geometry, but you have to embed them at a really particular location yeah, uh, world uh, volume location inside of the conifold geometry, uh, and the Cooperstein embedding is, is, is the favorite one for this, uh, for this purpose, and it leads to that particular gauge theory, where the strings that uh, the, the fields, the messenger fields, are the strings that uh, would stretch between this D7 brain and the fractional brains that are uh, uh, responsible for the clavinus strassner geometry, and there are many of them. Uh, but they've gone through a geometric transition. So those open strings you don't see. So most of the messengers, you don't see them here as open strings, but rather, uh, miraculous, at least rather yeah, miraculously, at least from the gauge theory perspective, there's still a particular uh, weakly coupled sector in this particular uh, non-supersymmetric theory that's associated with the antibrains. So there's a subset of these messengers here that indeed are going to be responsible for the communication of the SUSY breaking from this antibrain to the D7 brains. Uh, and since the D7 brains, um, again, they represent the global symmetry of, uh, say, some SUK symmetry, uh, but they have world volume gauge fields, and those world volume gauge fields are identified. They mix with the standard model gauge fields. So this is, in that respect, we should anticipate that that's indeed um, a, a, a gauge mediation model. But where the initial mediation is taking place by strings, that stretch between the NTD3 and this D7. And that's why I'm separating out the tip of the D7s, because initially you could also have imagined taking these D7s all the way down to the NT3 uh, D3 brain, but we want to have a, a messenger mass that's proportional to that distance. Notice one other feature is that actually the distance between the NTD3 brain and the D7 brain is not a constant. It's a function of where you are on the, on the D7 brain. So therefore, the mass 
of the D3 and the D3, D7 strings is, is yeah, is, they're lightest over here and they're much heavier over there. So, but one of the things that the entity 3 will, will do, it will actually uh, uh, exert a force on the D7 brain and that the force is going to be responsible for the SUSY breaking. Um, you can try to compute the force and actually that's the main computation that we're doing uh, by including the gravitational back reaction of the entity 3 and see how the trajectory of the D7 brain gets adjusted. Uh, and this is how we want to extract the, um, the SUSY parameters by looking eventually at the boundary correlation functions over here. Now, um, now there are various ways in which you can imagine uh, doing this calculation. As I was mentioning, there are the open strings that stretch between the NTD3 location and the D7 brain, so we can try to do the calculation in the open string channel by looking at the effective field theory on the D7 brains and on the NTD3 brains. Uh, and if need, we've done part of that calculation. We know what the NTD3 brain dynamics is, is non-supersymmetric because the NTD3 uh, is, the, is an, it's an NTD3 because it's not compatible with the fluxes that are inside of the clavinus transfer geometry and that incompatibility leads to mass splittings on the NTD3. Uh, and the NTD3 location also in, has an interaction with the D3, D7 strings which are our messengers. Uh, so there's these fields here are, have, um, there's the transverse motion of the D3 brains, they stretch the D3, D7 strings, that's represented by this term, uh, and uh, by integrating out this non-supersymmetric dynamics, we also get a mass splitting for the D3, D7 strings, and that then will be responsible, once you integrate out the D3, D7 strings out, uh, for a mass term for the uh, gauge boson on the D7 brain. Uh, you could also try to do the uh, computation in the closed string channel, and obviously you want to be able to compare the two. Uh, you would want to compute the back reaction to the NTD3, and as I mentioned, this has been done in the asymptotic region in this particular paper. And then embed the D7 brain in it and look at its deformation away from the pure Cooper, the supersymmetric Cooperstein embedding. Uh, we've done part of that computation. We have not done it uh, completely. We know what the total force on the D7 brain is. Uh, that's actually not the relevant term that you want to have because that total force is UV sensitive and it actually leads to a, a Planck suppressed uh, non susy contribution. Uh, we're interested in the normalizable deformation, so we're doing that computation still, but the expectation is that these things will eventually match and both methods uh, will produce a 5D gauge genome mass term that's localized in the infrared region and that's understandable because that's where the messenger fields are the lightest and it's also the thing that's closest to the NTD3. Uh, but, and then this mass for the Gagino is sequestered from the UV brain where the Planck, uh, sorry, yeah, the UV brain where the MSSM lives. So the initial um, uh, germ of, non, of, of supersymmetry breaking is the mass term for the Gagino. And this is called Gagino mediation. And indeed, feminologists have already contemplated a scenario of this type. Um, and, and, and they've looked at the phenomenology of it, where indeed the gay genome mass is being generated in a region that's separated from the standard model. I should say that this is uh, going to be a theme, is that, that basically what we're finding here, or what we're doing here, is we're just uh, yeah, testing uh, certain assumptions uh, or uh, re trying to make realizations of ideas that phenomenologists have already put forward. Uh, they've already explored these, these kind of things in extra dimensions, but having an explicit duality between a known gauge theory and a known geometry using the rules of string theory is, is a good way of, of, of uh, yeah, putting string theory to use uh, and, and, and uh, testing some of these ideas. Another idea that um, phenomenologists are already f uh, familiar with is that gauge genome mediation is actually um, uh, known to be a, a, a limit of gauge mediation in the limit where you would have many messenger fields. If I would go back to the uh, diagram that leads to the gauge genome mass, uh, let me briefly do that. Uh, here we go. Uh, if I take this particular uh, diagram here, again, this con contributes to the scalar mass by a factor of n, if n is the number of messengers, uh, to the scalar mass squared by a factor of n, and here by a factor of n. Uh, in the gay genome mass. So having many messengers actually in, enhances the importance of this particular term, and that's exactly what happened also in this, um, uh, in this 
uh, holographic dual model. Now, um, one problem you could immediately worry about is that if that's the explanation, and indeed if this uh, ADS geometry needs to be classical, then I need a large N theory, which actually means that I have a large number of messengers, and that's known to be a problem at least to lambda poles because the running goes too fast. And that problem is, exp is explicitly present here as well. The D7 brain uh, cannot extend too far in this region because then its volume would be too big and the gauge coupling of the four-dimensional theory is, is inversely proportional to the volume of that D7 and that puts an upper limit on how far this D7 can actually go into this throat. And to be honest, there's a relatively small parameter range where, where one would be able to trust uh, this particular setup, and indeed we're squeezed in a corner where n can be a little bit uh, big, but then we, uh, then the scale of SUSY breaking would have to be quite high. But still there's a range where we can uh, uh, basically uh, play this particular game. Now let me, uh, just in the last five minutes, uh, consider a, a slightly different scenario generalizing this kind of uh, setup where uh, rather than just putting everything on the UV brain, uh, I could imagine that some of the standard model fields might uh, arise as composites of this particular setup, meaning that there are uh, meson fields, going to be meson fields in the bulk that um, would have the quantum numbers of some of the matter fields of the MSSM. So that's a game I'm going to play in a second. Let me make one other comment, is that if you really want to make this into a more full-fledged string construction, then obviously what's going on here is the following, is that there was this hidden sector that I've been talking about up to now, but if I want to make the standard model, which I was imagining li living on some brain over here, now that brain doesn't really exist in a, in a, in a real string setting, you would have to really put your Calabi-Yau manifold there and actually do an, a construction, F-theory type construction, presumably, that would uh, have the standard model live down here. But uh, the, if the SUSY breaking really originates down here, the part of the point of all of this is that you don't need to know too much about the details of what's going down here. Uh, up, yeah, if, if this leads to the standard model, you can do the communication and the computation just within the hidden sector. But now I'm going to change that game by putting part of the standard model degrees of freedom rather than putting it here. I'm going to put them in the bulk. Now, the way you would do that, indeed, uh, as we've uh, learned from previous talks, is uh, by having intersecting these seven brains. Uh, you want to get at chiral matter uh, that uh, transforms in the, in, in the Vive of SU5, for example. Uh, and then you have these two uh, brain intersections. Uh, the, this is a fl an extra brain that intersects with our K flavor brains, say, five, the SU5 brains. Uh, that intersection, in the, from the ADS point of view, extends in the radial direction. But we're actually interested in having uh, modes uh, of the, with the quantum numbers of the quarks that are going to be uh, localized within the bulk region. Uh, because those kind of modes will be composite modes from the uh, dual perspective. And indeed one can show that by looking at the equation of motion of fields, and this is a similar calculation in the work that was done in the F-theory work of Fava and collaborators, uh, where you look at the intersection between the seven brains and you look at the modes that live there and one can indeed uh, show that there are modes that are localized in the infrared by an equation of this type where, um, by solving that mode. Uh, so those infrared localized modes, you would have to interpret them as, as composite fields that live in the bulk. Now an interesting calculation that, again, phenomenologists have already done for us uh, is now to actually look at the extra contribution from uh, the so non SUSY breaking to the mass of the modes that live in, the, um, in this bulk region uh, because they're more sensitive to the SUSY breaking because they're closer to the source of SUSY breaking. And uh, so this paper of the Wolf, Kasher, and Mulgan that looked at the NTD3 deformation, if you take their result and you go to a limit, basically the ADS-like limit, uh, far away from the NTD3, you can identify a deformation that's due to the antibrain, uh, and that is the non susy deformation. And you can uh, determine the parameters that beta in terms of parameters of your uh, Clevenus Strassler type uh, gauge theory. And uh, now the next thing you would do is to uh, look at this, this infrared localized node uh, and to see um, what kind of mass it picks up from this deformation. You, compute its mass by looking at its equation of motion in the bulk. Uh, and you find an answer where, uh, not surprisingly, 
uh, that depends rather sensitively on how this mode behaves, whether it's localized in the IR or localized in the UV. If it's localized in the IR, which is true for this coefficient b bigger than 1, uh, from the field theory perspective, what that means is that the corresponding dual operator is such that the term in the interaction Lagrangian that couples the quark field to the uh, composite operator is a relevant operator and therefore is relevant in the infrared. Uh, and therefore, in that case, you would really expect this quark to be a composite field because of this mixing term. Uh, and indeed, for those, that case, if B uh, is bigger than 1, you find the biggest contribution to the mass splitting. If B is less than 1, you find another contribution from this uh, gravity calculation, uh, other shape of the contribution, which is suppressed by a power of 1 over Z1, where Z1 is the uh, extent to which you go towards the infrared, which is the, the location of the infrared brain, if you like. Uh, so this is a Planck suppressed uh, suppression that's simply due to the RG running from the fact that this operator is actually an irrelevant operator for the case that B is less than 1. So you can understand from the gauge theory perspective why this thing is, is, uh, is suppressed. So I've just given you a bit of a, a flavor of, of, of a game that one can play where essentially these formulas that I was writing down at the end were indeed formulas that were computed by phenomenologists in a particular setting, but here we have given a particular string utilization, just saying, okay, well, the assumptions that these people have made uh, uh, are, uh, can indeed be realized in a particular string setting. So we started essentially, uh, our, our, our introduction of string theory was more motivated by wanting to couple uh, things to, uh, to study a strongly coupled hidden sector, but along the way we've sort of in incorporated uh, some more of the aims of string theory. Um, one thing that we immediately saw is that the geometric perspective on what is really responsible for the supersymmetry breaking uh, is this gay genome mediation me mechanism, which by the way from the 4D perspective, from a pure 4D perspective is rather surprising. Uh, it's really the fact that this strongly coupled hidden gauge theory somehow produces rather magically uh, KK excitations for all the standard model fields, essentially, in particular for the gauge fields, and that uh, in that KK terminology that the SUSI breaking is separated from initially from the standard model in this. In our study, we ended up uh, looking at the dynamics of D brains, D7 brains, and we also are generating when we're interested in these composite models, the light generations of matter by these seven brain interactions. So it's rather natural to try to combine our setup uh, with the recent insights in F-theory model building as a way of, another way of at least in introducing uh, SUSY breaking in, in, uh, in string from logical setup. Let me uh, end there. Thrillsy. I expect it to be the same because uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, when supersymmetry is small, now the supersymmetry is small, uh, often uh, the there is no limit of open string computation and closed string computation disagree. And uh, even less so, uh, the even more so in the case without supersymmetry. So why do you expect to disagree? Okay, so the question is why these calculations would have still some match. Uh, let me uh, just say the following. When I say the open string channel, um, I, it's true that you would want to work in this, uh, in this particular description, uh, indeed if the open strings are relatively short, if, if indeed uh, relative to the changes in the geometry, uh, otherwise you would want to have to go to the geometric description. So when I say agree, I mean sort of more at a qualitative level, because the intuition that the, the, that the mass of the D3, D7 strings uh, is, is, is suppressed by the, that separation, I think should also build, still hold in, 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 the, in the other regime. Um, uh, so when I say compatible, I, I, I mean at least that the two intuitions are not, not incompatible. So I, I wouldn't want to say that quantitatively this completely gives the same. But indeed, these are, these are indeed are valid in different regimes depending on the separation between the NTD3 and, and, and the D7. Other questions? If, if not, let's thank Herman again.